light itself is not more persistent than the stream of feminine discourse. Edwin Abbott, Flatland. Welcome back. Let's continue our Servantine journey through history's greatest novel. Chapter 50 performs another miraculous narrative maneuver. It takes Cidiamete's explanation of what actually happened in Don Quixote's room when he and Doña Rodriguez were attacked and weaves it together with the arrival of the Duke and Duchess's page at Sancho's home bearing gifts and letters for Teresa. A double narrative now becomes a triple narrative. We learned that Altisidora and her friend were the intruders who avenged Rodriguez's disloyalty to the Duchess, specifically the fact that she had made public knowledge the Aranjuez of her leg fountains. Did you know, during the early modern period, neither Henry VIII of England nor Islam were particularly feminist? On one hand, feminine discourse continues to dominate the novel. On the other hand, the narrator says women are not perfect. Affronts that go against the beauty and vanity of women awaken in them an immense ire and kindle in them a desire for revenge. Next, we learn that the page sent to visit Sancho's family had previously played the part of Dulcinea enchanted by Merlin. So women are not always what they seem. Teresa and Sanchica's chatter in this episode echoes the pettiness of Altisidora and the Duchess. They repeatedly relish their new power and status. Teresa brags, we have ourselves a little governorship and imagines humiliating her rivals. Let the most arrogant Hidalga snub me now for I'll set her straight. Sanchica fantasizes about provoking the envy of others by going to court in a coach, as if she were the popus. Bad year and bad month for all the gossipers in the world, and as long as I'm warm, let the people laugh. The two women even bicker over who gets the coral necklace sent by the Duchess. Sanchica, look, you're gonna have to share that necklace with me, Teresa, let me wear it on my neck a few days. Note the exchange between Teresa and the Duchess. The Duchess's gifts of the necklace and Sancho's green jacket that will be made into a dress for Sanchica are followed by her request for acorns. Note also the episode's allusions to a rigid caste society being dismantled by just such commerce. Teresa is a Cinderella figure rebelling against her arrogant neighbors, the Hidalgas who think that because they're Hidalgas, the wind shouldn't touch them, and who go to church with all the arrogance of queens, and who seem to think it's a dishonor to even look at a peasant woman. She sees the Duchess as her ally. This good lady, even though she is a Duchess, she calls me her friend and she treats me like her equal. Quixotic Mission. Whom could the Duchess represent? A. Stephanie Faya. B. Queen Isabel I of Spain. C. Jennifer Lopez. Correct answer. B. Queen Isabel I of Spain. The page then highlights this egalitarianism as a distinguishing characteristic of the Aragonese nobility. The ladies of Aragon, even though they're just as well born, are not as punctilious and self-important as Castilian ladies, and they treat people in a simpler manner. Cervantes also targets religious orthodoxy here. The necklace the Duchess gives to Teresa is a parody of a garish rosary. The Hail Marys are of fine coral, and the Our Fathers are of beaten gold. Likewise, our priest is so stunned by all the contradictions that he becomes a doubting Thomas. On one hand, I can see and touch the fineness of this coral, and on the other hand, I read that a duchess has requested two dozen acorns. 
The narrator tells us that the priest and Carrasco realize that the page is mocking Sancho's women. Nevertheless, the same narrator tells us that the two men are so shocked by this turn of events that they think they might be losing their minds like Don Quixote. Carrasco speaks to the page on their behalf. Even though we touched the presence and we have read the letters, we do not believe and we think that this is one of those things that concern our compatriot Don Quixote who thinks they are all performed by enchantment. And so I have half a mind to touch and feel your grace in order to see whether you are a phantasmagoric ambassador or a man of flesh and bone. The page's response is double. He echoes the narrator in Don Quixote Part 2, Chapter 10. The truth is what I have stated, and it is what will always rise above falsehood, like oil above water. Then, in Latin, he cites an earlier passage from the same biblical text alluded to by Carrasco, Operibus credite et non verbis. In other words, credit the works, not the words, alluding to John, Chapter 10, Verse 38. That's all for now. Keep reading, the story only gets better in the coming chapters. If you liked this video and want to continue learning more about the knight errant Don Quixote de la Mancha, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Also, you can enroll in our free online course on Don Quixote by clicking here.